I guess you're all here, so you're excited about VR, but I guess the first question um, maybe I should ask these guys is like, should we be doing this as journalists? Is this the right time? I have a friend who said, ah, it's like the Newton, that's someday. Uh, so I guess I'll ask both of you, should journalists be doing VR? Is this the right time to do it? Maureen, you start. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I certainly think so. I, I ended up on the Daily 360 team because I was working at the Times Magazine and um, you know, about a, a year and a half ago when we started doing VR. And it was amazing to just be dropped in the deep end. Um, and uh, the effect on the type of storytelling that we can do and, uh, and the type of uh, explorations we can do um, has been pretty profound. So I think when the Times first started these explorations, it was like, we'll make one and then we'll see. And um, the response has been so great that it feels like it was the right choice to start on this path in the first place. And it's a crazy path because you guys have committed to doing one a day for an entire year. What are you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. Um, um, I mean, I do remember when this idea came up for the first time six or eight months ago, and I heard it, and it was like, that's crazy. Um, and then when it, I mean, I, I, I'm not even sure when our team started if we really thought we could get it done. I mean, I know Veda, who's in the audience, I believe when she got interviewed, it's like, do you think we can do it every day? And she was like, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but you figure it out. And having um, the Samsungs, having cameras that you can stitch quickly and easily has allowed us to, to start to figure out what VR breaking news is you know, and how to, how to do that. Cool. Yeah. Dan, what do you think? Uh, well, you know, I mean, with any new technology like this, you know, we saw this even when the internet you know, started, and I kind of rode that wave in the, the journalism field back with WashingtonPost.com early in the, uh, back in the day. And uh, the same questions are asked then as are asked now with this, right? Which is, well, you know, is it too early? Is it, you know, this is very expensive. Should we be investing in this or not? And the reality is, though, that, uh, and this is something that I think Nani brings up a lot, uh, VR, the, the, the current wave of, of virtual reality, journalism was involved at the very beginning through Palmer Lucky, who was uh, working with Nani. Um, on, on some things. I mean, they were kind of, in, he was the lab assistant, I believe, or something along those lines. And, uh, you know, since then, what has really kind of taken off in the VR field uh, financially has not been, been journalistic. It's been video games. It's been Hollywood. And everyone should realize there are, you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars going into VR right now, uh, which I include 360 in that, but it's VR, AR, MR uh, from Hollywood. And so this isn't a question of, Oh, sh you know, should we be investing in VR? The investment's happening. The real question I think that we need to, to be asking is, how do we make sure the values of journalist, uh, journalism are continue to be embedded within this medium? Because it's so powerful. All this stuff you know, that Jeff was talking about with, with uh, you know, empathy and you know, the immersion and the feeling that you're there. Okay? I used to say this uh, before Vladimir Putin was in the, in the news as much as he is, is now, but imagine what a Vladimir Putin can do with this kind of technology, right? To, or others, right? to uh, not inform, but persuade people, not with facts, but with uh, you know, almost like implanted ideas and memories. It's a little scary. So I think it's a time where we really need to double down, and thanks you know, the, the Knight Foundation and, and Google you know, will hopefully help with this, to really just make sure that, that the values that are important to journalism are, continue to be part of this. It's, and, and Nani helped with that at the very beginning. So in terms of, of making money, because the big thing with journalism now is like, oh, we, we don't have any money, but there's sponsored content. You guys are doing sponsored content too, aren't you? Is that part of the stream that uh, VR 360 for um, uh, advertisers as well? Well, our the Daily 360 is a, is spon is a so it is sponsored it's content a in a way. It's yeah. a partnership. It is not. Uh, I should be very clear that like there is no influence over editorial. Um, it is purely like a technology partnership. Um, and it's the same thing with the longer form NYTVR pieces where there'll be an editorial piece and then a more commercial piece that get paired together and that that's part of how the funding will work. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, in part because the f we have been able to find sponsorship, that's why this stuff is possible. Yeah, um, but, but it's very important for us that like as they support the technology that we still can have uh, all the editorial integrity that yeah the that editorial independence yeah and I guess to Dan's point if we don't jump in now then the, we're not going to have that in that way yeah yeah that it's worth sort of being you know figuring stuff out as as you go in order to be able to to rise with the level of the work 
Yeah. And you were talking a bit about discovery, and they were talking about uh, you know the, the the value of them making films and, and yeah. So I funding. mean, where, uh, where I teach at the Newhouse School, we have a, a very large film department. So it's really that, that and some the, the entertainment side of, of the media business is you know about half of of uh, uh, what drives um, Newhouse. And so about half of my students actually come from those programs and. I, what they're finding is with just a little bit of, of knowledge, when they go and they, they, they go out and look for jobs, companies are, ver are, are putting also millions of dollars into experimenting, but then they're, you know, some of that's in going to uh, news organizations like New York Times, which is great, but also to places like Discovery. And uh, they, they um, told me when they were reaching out uh, looking for interns that uh, they're just amazed that something that's so new can already be, they didn't say profitable, but they said, there's revenue, like a lot of revenue in this at the very beginning, right? Which is something, I think it's a mistake that we kind of, a lot of us made, some of us, us, us in the room, uh, back in the early days of uh, you know, online journalism and the internet, right? Where we said, okay, we just like build, let's get all this activity and you know, we'll, we'll figure out how to make money later. Eh, I think it's a good thing that we're now making money at the same time in, in a really smart way, right? And that that's gonna sustain this um, going forward, It's my hope. And I think it speaks uh, to journalism in general, too. There's a student here, Guillermo, who's going to be joining the team at uh, the New York Times 360. And he was a guy who basically just said, like, oh, this sounds great. I want to do it. Uh, what can I try to do it? And he literally jumped in. I think the secret, and probably I'll be killed right after this for telling it, you guys this, is that um, nobody really knows everything. And so everybody's figuring it out. And so why not jump in as a journalist? and? and be that way too. I think that's sort of the attitude we have here. And some students have just really taken to it, which is pretty exciting. Um, and I, I'm a big lover of new things too. Well, speaking of lovers of new things, do you guys remember the moment when the light went on when you think like, wow, this is, this is possible? I remember seeing, um, I, I didn't like this idea at first. You had to put a thing on your face, and you couldn't communicate with other people. And then I saw the displace, the times, and it was like, oh my god, I was actually there. And I remember even being in a shot where people sliding by you. And I'd actually been a journalist and worked overseas. And I thought, like, I feel like I'm in that room. And for me, that was the moment where I felt like this is a possibly really powerful kind of way of telling a story. Do you guys remember the moment when it sort of the light bulb went on for you, Dan? <laughs> uh, well, uh, yeah, the moment is sitting right here with Nani. Mm -hmm. uh, we had known each other before um, through the Night News Challenge, actually. So it's funny how things kind of move around. And so uh, I started an ONA conference, and uh, she was telling me, I think after a few drinks, you really have to come try this, this put these virtual reality goggles on, and it's an amazing other story. And I, I mean, I was very skeptical, uh, which I, I was very clear about. But I think there were a few more drinks, and I said, OK, I'll, I'll do it. Um, but I also was hesitant because I get motion sick. I don't know if you remember this, but uh, and she said, no, it, it, it's much better than, you know, uh, than it used to be. Much better than a few more drinks. <laughs> and, and a few more drinks, right? So, um, and I just remember when I then went into uh, Hunger in Los Angeles, she had their ONA. I just had this you know, holy bleep moment where, I, I, I mean, I, everything you say about you know, the brain being tricked into thinking of somewhere else, and I immediately thought, how could we allow people to uh, experience stories rather than just sit back and listen to them. How can this uh, you know, be used, sorry, we're silencing our cell phones. <laughs> uh, how can this be used to, uh, to really allow, allow people to understand very complex information at a visceral level? And you know, since I've kind of, I'm stealing all kinds of terms from you, uh, spatial awareness, right, or, or uh, spatial narratives, right? There's so much potential, but it really was, was after I went through Hunger in Los Angeles. Can you just mention a bit about what Hunger in Los Angeles is about, sort of what, and, and maybe the moment of it that, uh, Sorry. you can see we're all One technologically advanced up here. Yeah, 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 that's right. Um, so hopefully I can uh, communicate this right. So there was a project that uh, uh, USC was working on involving uh, educating people about uh, the fact that there are people in America who go hungry. And uh, Nani was involved in that um, and decided she wanted to do something different. <laughs> and so she did, uh, wanted to recreate the experience of a man who was standing in line waiting for food and was waiting so long that he ended up uh, uh, passing out, uh, went into a, a diabetic coma, I believe, right? And, um, and so she she's, uh, sent somebody there who got a bunch of audio and then also I think took a lot of photos. 
and no one had done what you'd done before, right? And using, okay, so with you know, very little knowledge about how to do this, you just dove right into it and took technology from the motion capture, or from the, um, the, the movie industry with motion capture cameras and then uh, uh, reversed it so that instead of, of, uh, ca of you know, capturing an actor whose motion would then be applied to Spider-Man, it was instead capturing your action as a participant in the story. And so as a result, instead of just reading something at arm's length or watching a, you know, a news clip about how there's a lot of people waiting in line for food and then a man you know, fell over in a diabetic coma, you're standing right there and you're in line and then you're in the story and everything that, that happens in there is based on something that, that was you know, real facts. Uh, the, and I'm sure you have notebooks that are full of you know, the, the, all the data that you pulled together. And it's such an amazing way to then, um, I mean, you talk, talk about empathy. I have memories now, I have dreams, I mean, for real, of being in that line. And the man falls over and then not being able to help him. It's also a little odd because you can't change the story, right? You're sort of, it's almost like you're a, you're a ghost and, and, and you're watching it happen. Some people get very emotional about this. But it's, it's, it's very powerful. That's Hunger in Los Angeles. Um, is that playing down the hallway or? Mm, sure. No, we but. But it's the idea. I think in, in part two, the, the, it's the story, right? As journalists, we're always talking about the story and the, the power of that story. Do you remember the moment for you, Maureen, when it just sort of turned where you thought, like, wow? Yeah, I, um, I think I, I put a headset on for the first time probably about two two and a half years ago, and I'd worked a lot with Chris Milk, who's kind of a VR, you know, in a slightly more commercial world. He runs Verse, now called Within, um, and we were just meeting at a cafe, and he put me in a headset, and I watched um, the this piece Verse had made about a protest in New York, um, and I was actually at that protest, um, so it was sort in of- In VR or in real life? In real life, I had huh. been there um, the day that they filmed, so it was sort of a bizarre, um, feeling, um, but they had, I remember they had the camera right next to um, a very impassioned protester, and, um, and I realized that even though I had been there, I would have never gotten that close to that person, that that like sort of swell of emotion had felt like too much for me. Um, so and I, so I was like, by the end of watching it, I was like crying in the headset and took it off. I was like, how do I do it? Like, how do I make this? Um, exactly. And um, and shortly after, started working at the Times Magazine. Right around the time that they started making VR, and then got to make a piece with them, and and then ended up on this team. So. Yeah. So there's like lots of stories you can tell in visuals, but uh, and I think part of the thing about visuals is choosing the right story to tell. So what do you think is a good story to tell in, in VR based on experiences, Maureen? Uh, you know, you guys are cranking out one a day at this unbelievable pace. I'm sure that some are great successes, some are failures. What are some of the things that you've learned to look for in a story that you think like that's going to be great for? for VR 360. Yeah, well, I mean, I think like you'll hear a lot of us say like the space-based stories, like place-based stories are exciting. Um, I mean, we just had a, a whole bunch of um, 360 pieces in the 52 places to go. We do a lot of partnering with travel because um, that's like a good, like you want to be there, you want to look around. Um, but then also, you know, we had a very successful uh, piece about a mental hospital in Venezuela. And part of what made that so compelling was that it was really well reported and that, and that being in that place was very upsetting and revealed um, a story that, you know, you wanted to look around and you had sort of a painful witness. You, were, you became a witness by, by looking around. So um, certainly place-based, um, you know, when you can be close with somebody that you might not have the opportunity. Like we had a small piece that where Ai Weiwei carried the camera around um, Tompkins Square Park and, and that was great just because he's a person that you don't normally get to get that close to. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's, so it's an interesting range and I think something that we have been talking about a lot of the times is that there's some things that 360 does well and there's a lot of things that it doesn't do well and we're trying to sort of find our, uh, our strengths and to play to those, particularly in the context of, the, of a place like the Times that 
that already does a lot of things really well. So we're trying to find the places where we can really lift and expand um, stories and show you something that you wouldn't be able to, to see otherwise. What are one of the things that, that you think it doesn't do well? Um, uh, <laughs> analysis uh, is not great. Um, you know, I, I think that we've had certain stories where, where it's like the article functions better in that way. Um, I think, uh, I think character-driven stories can be complicated. Um, How so? How do you mean? Well, you know, there's certain videos. Every time we get a pitch, we're asking, like, is that a video right. or is that a 360? Like, why do you need to be in that place, um, and and why do we need to know the person in this way? Um, and I think that's a lot of as we've been sorting through pitches, making sure that it's like. Why do you want to look in every direction in this place where you are? Like, why do you want to feel like a, an intimacy with the character here? And you know, so it, so it's a fine line, right? Because I said like, oh, being with Ai Weiwei is great, but a character-driven story is difficult. So I think we're still sort of finding our way through, um, but we have to ask that question every time, like, why, why in 360? Yeah. And there is something interesting, for instance, for with the Ai Weiwei, is that the 360 functions as the audience. And so he's looking right at you every time you, he walks with you, he just carries the camera. But you feel like, basically, Ai Weiwei is carrying you. And I think that's another thing that's pretty cool. Um, but uh, rather than sort of being able to look away, when the camera is the viewer, and so that's another way I think that's changed the way we tell stories, too. Mm -hmm. One thing I know that I've learned a bunch from my students, whether they fail or succeed, how about you, Dan? Things that you think work particularly well or, <laughs> or, or not at all? I mean, yeah, there, I, well, the, the important thing is the experiments, right? So um, I have a, uh, actually a, a class called, uh, that's not a virtual reality class called Emerging Media Platforms. Uh, two of the students are actually back here. I got to meet them for the first time because there's an online class. And uh, Carl Corey over here, if you can raise your hand, he, he did something that, um, well, I think these, these uh, uh, you know, 360 stories about um, you know, empathy and, and really helping you kind of understand uh, what someone else's uh, situation is like are super important. But there are also uh, just more, um, you know, uh, uh, less, uh, uh, what's the word here? Just more kind of, you know, run of the day, you know, normal stories that are just interesting. So what, what Carl thought of, since he's a restaurant reviewer, is, well, could you, uh, take a bunch of 360 photos in a new restaurant that's about to open, and as part of the review, he then built something where you can kind of move through the restaurant and you hotspot different areas and say, okay, I want to sit in the chair, you know, and get that experience, and then go meet the chef, and there's uh, information that comes up, and so you know that, and, and then he actually went out and uh, and interviewed people, and you know, it, it had uh, control groups, you know, one that saw used the 360, one that didn't, and. Right, so there's a lot, I think that it's important to just do, do experiments like that. But we've had students uh, go up into the Krauss Bell Tower, which if you've ever been to Syracuse University, we call it the Harry Potter Castle. And it's a place that everybody always thinks, wow, I hear the bells, you know, uh, playing. And there are, we know that there are people who play those bells, right? Or I think they actually use a, a keyboard. And now I've had three different groups of students who have gone up there, and now you can go and hang out up in the Krauss Bell Tower, right? So places that people, would always want to go to, but they can't have access to it, or maybe they can't afford it, right? So then, you know, I think just, you know, being able to transport your consciousness to really cool places around the earth, just that by itself, I think is like a whole category, virtual travel or whatever you want to call that. But, you know, I think what's more interesting is what have we not tried, right? What, what do we not know that we don't know right. <laughs> in, in this field? And that's why it's exciting. It's, it's really is true, I think, right now that it's impossible to do things the wrong way unless you make some big ethical mistake, and I think that's something that should be talked about more, but it's, it's really hard to, to make a mistake if you're, if you're you know, you just, you, you've, you've got to throw the spaghetti in the wall, right? And then, you know, um, uh, you know, use the lean startup method of, you know, try something, measure it, you know, see what worked. If it didn't work, then try something else. And eventually, that's how we then find, uh, you know, what, what the, the best stories are. And I think uh, students, and just uh, you know, young enterprising journalists in general, and not just young. So, uh, uh, that's really the um, you know the way that we're going to figure all this out. And you know what I think you know what the Times is doing, what places like Discovery do, what our students do. I think sharing all that through Journalism 360 or, or other organizations is this is the time to do it now, right? Don't you know? It's like they say in. Uh, 
well, they used to say in preschools, like, you know, you get the cookies, don't hog the cookies, right? <laughs> so I've got to share the cookies with everybody. Sure. I remember my first spaghetti totally missing the wall. And then we got a camera, and I walked down Ninth Avenue. And of course, in 360, you forget that you are always there. And so I'm just looking around. When you're looking ahead, first of all, you're bouncing up and down. And then um, to steal a, a, a note from Jenna Pirog, who's the New York Times. Oh, she is. Perfect timing. There she is. <laughs> I won't embarrass her, but she calls them potential puke moments or potential puke shots. So, uh, but the idea is that the first thing every student does is grab the camera and starts walking with it. But of course, uh, the camera keeps bouncing up and down, and then you've got this weird person that's always right next to you as you look around. And I think it's valuable to, for everyone to go through that mistake. Um, and the great thing about these smaller cameras is to sort of make a lot of experiments and make a lot of failures, too, I, I think. I just kind of something you said there. Uh, Keep in mind that it's not just journalists who have been playing around with these technologies. Uh, and it's not even you know, just recently. Going back 20, 30 years, people have been experimenting with this kind of stuff. And it's been in you know, multi-million dollar funded labs for different industries. There's a lot of research out there that tells you what's going to make people sick and what's not. It's called simulation sickness, by the way. It's not motion sickness. It's one thing to be aware of. And, uh, Two, two really important things to keep in mind if you, if you go into this area. It's known, we, we know 100% that if you move the camera faster than a walking, walking pace, so even if it's really steady, you're going to make people sick. Okay, and there's no way around that. There's, there's studies that, that, that back this up. And then also, if you require people to read, what I say, read more than a tweet, you're going to trigger simulation sickness. So I, I think this is the kind of information that, you know, there's a lot we could mine from... Uh, the VR pioneers of, you know, of days past and maybe involve them in this current um, wave, right? I mean, and I think it's also worth, I think part of our challenge for starting the Daily 360 was taking the, the rules that, that we had been learning about being in headset and how they apply to like when you're looking at a 360 on desktop or on mobile and kind of what you can get away with and how the rules might shift a little bit and um, allowing ourselves freedom to make those mistakes and to see what might what might work or, sure. or what doesn't. Um, and that there are certain things that like yeah, we put on the headset and it's like uh, nope. But then um, if you you know if you want to scroll through that on desktop, you do get a little bit more leeway. And it's tricky too because you don't know if someone's going to look at this in Facebook or you know on their desktop or on their phone yeah. or put the VR headset on, and you can't control that. So it's 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 tough. You almost I almost feel like we need some kind of easy way for people to understand. Here's what you're likely to experience, and it's it's best viewed this way. Maybe not for, you know for VR or you know for, for a VR headset. It's this is ideal for that. And you're going to really be immersed, and it's you know it's got a high comfort level. Sure. Perhaps I don't know. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. So Maureen, one of the things about the Times is you mentioned that you're trying to put put them out onto many platforms. Mm -hmm. How? I mean. Just talk a bit about that strategy of trying to get it to as many people as possible and, and what you think, how they're experiencing it, and how that might affect the way you create the work, too. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think part of the idea behind the Daily 360 was really to get uh, more and more of the Times readers, it, like a gateway drug, you know? So even if they hadn't been in headset yet, if they could get used to scrolling around, if they could get used to moving their phone around, then it becomes a medium that they uh, you know, are accustomed to interacting with. Um, so it's been interesting to see stuff, you know, go out on how it affect how it is on Facebook versus how it is in our app, um, and uh, and we are constantly being informed by how people are reacting to it, and and that helps us to learn what works best. Um, but yeah, we're I mean we have it on multiple platforms, so that however whatever kind of phone you have, whatever kind of device you have you can still access it. And Facebook, as you said, is still the 10,000 pound gorilla then. Most people see it there. Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a heavy, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a place where it gets a lot of circulation. Right. Yeah. Dan, thoughts about that, about uh, getting well, I mean, your work out? I mean, just, uh, you know, get, with Facebook, keep in mind, Facebook owns Oculus. So it's really, in the future, going to be on your Facebook. It's just a matter of when. And they're already, their engineers already work very closely together. So. Uh, but I think also then kind of going beyond that, uh, you know, Sony with the PlayStation VR, there are 80 million people who have PlayStations. There's a very high addressable market. So we're going to see so like many more different kind of platforms. There's going to be different, you know, waves of this. And um, it's just, I think, being going multi-platform is a way to, to look at it. Mm -hmm. And then measuring, uh, 
you know, not just the traffic, but also, I think there's a lot more that has to be measured beyond that, you know? Well, and we were right? talking about how, how Facebook, if you hit a certain number of views, you get a heat map, um, which has been like, we've been joking that they're like our like report cards, you know, um, because you can actually see where people are viewing and whether they're going up or down and like, can our text help to lead somebody's eye? Um, and, uh, and is it truly a 360 shot in that people are looking in every direction or did we make a shot that is, you know, that is a 90 degree shot? Um, and so Facebook for that reason alone has been super useful for us as a tool to learn how people are interacting. And then we really do make adjustments then, do you know, to say like, oh my God, there was an amazing thing happening down here and nobody saw it. So how do we change the story that we're telling to draw people's eye? And especially, you know, like you were saying, it's such a range of like, we, we don't have spatial audio, so like we can't necessarily like pull somebody with an audio cue back here. So what tools do we have to, to draw their eye and how can we keep improving? So just since you, you have that data, are there general things? Do people look all the way around all the time or do they look around until they find something and then they just kind of settle there? It's, it's different on every piece. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think when you have like a really great uh, space that you want to look around, people do. They look in every direction, you know? Um, and I, and I think sometimes we find as we're storytelling that there's something where it's like, oh, that's an amazing 360 shot and that's really more of a focus shot for the storytelling. And then we come to another great 360 shot. Um, so, and is um, that something in the editing that you try to do, sort of not put all the great 360 shots together? Or? I mean, we, <laughs> we get as many great 360 the shots as we can, <laughs> you know? So um, yeah, I think the fact that we're making so many means that like we're tinkering with the formula every day and and for short form i mean i think it's a new that's a new way of thinking about it you know that everything we're making is under two minutes so that's a whole different sort of formula just that it's like a little burst right yeah Dan, yeah there's some other techniques too that are uh, that was interesting i would love to see that facebook data by the way. <laughs> I'm trying to get access but um there, there's some other kind of other techniques that are out there that are really uh, very low tech. I mean, actually, the most effective ones are, are they're, they're pretty obvious. And the, the best example I've seen of guiding someone's attention was from Zilla Watson at the BBC, who Emblematic uh, introduced me to uh, through another panel. And they, uh, I forget uh, the, the role of this person, but he was giving a, a tour of the Tate Modern Museum in London. And you start off on one end of the Millennium Bridge, and he's kind of point, and, and he's a guide, okay? Mm -hmm. this, is the key. The, the, this, this human guide is right there. We know from just standard video that when you see a face, you watch the person, right? right? Even if there's a lot of stuff going on, in fact, even if there's a lot of stuff going on, you're probably even more likely to watch a face because when you're immersed, you can it can be overwhelming, right? And if there's somebody who's talking to you, even without a spatial audio, the spatial audio is something to look into. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a minute because I think that's, that's sort of the next uh, wave. But uh, uh, in this case, uh, this, this guide is kind of saying, he, he, you're standing at one of the bridge, and he says, and if you look over here at this building, and he, he's just gesturing his hand, and then you naturally then follow his hand, and then you fade over to the other side of the, of the, the bridge. And it's so effective, it's almost magic, right? right. But it's not like a VR uh, you know, piece of magic. It's just you know, editing and storytelling and, and really smart, um, I, want, I shouldn't say staging, but having that guide kind of point things out to you can be one effect. Well, there's many different techniques like that that are out there that you know, I think we just need to share more. Yeah, there's one piece, uh, I don't know if it's playing here, it's called Notes on Blindness, which is a, the VR component, and I think the Times Magazine did it, um, to a documentary film about um, uh, John Hall, who uh, was a man who went blind and made audio tapes. But his descriptions of the world as he's losing his sight are so well suited to this, and you're so wowed by the story. He said, I'm sitting in the park, and over there is Dan Pacheco, Talk, his phone is buzzing, mm -hmm. and you normally look to your left, right? <laughs> uh, but uh, at the end of that, I thought, like, wow, this is like the perfect story for VR. And so part of it is this discovery of like what really works, what really leads you to something, and others that are like, I can't read all that text, as you said. The the tweet is a great kind of way of going through yeah, it yeah, too. Yeah. Um, and then uh, a, a video I'd recommend watching. Just so we talk a lot about journalism, but you know, look look elsewhere too. You too did a really awesome video with uh, uh, within Chris Milk's company, uh, with the song um, a song for someone I think, and basically it starts off where you see just Bono right here, and then uh, slowly the uh, the whole scene kind of fills in, and then you see the whole band around you, which I put students in that, and they're they're crying, and some of them say I'm so embarrassed Bono's singing to me, um, 
But then what happens is it becomes a global band, like music jam band. You have a kid on his uh, bed in India playing his guitar over here, and then you have uh, uh, you know, some um, um, uh, Mexican can canciones singing over this way, and it's really cool. I think there's a lot of artistic types of, um, of uh, techniques that, you know, in the, in the right circumstances, could also be applied to news. Um, and, and, you know, there's also nothing wrong with art. I mean, you all do a lot of that kind of artistic type of 360 mm -hmm. too, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, I this mean, stuff can be fun. It doesn't have to be all serious. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we'll put these notes in that document we mentioned too. We'll put in links to the stories or, or things that we have. Um, how, the thing that, one thing we did mention is that YouTube actually, uh, anyone can upload a 360 video to YouTube. And I remember, doing this at the beginning is like, okay, so we made this video, but now no one can see it. And there were very specific companies, one of which has gone out of business. And then pretty soon, like, wow, you can put it on YouTube. And now in YouTube, you can see it in a viewer. You can see it um, on your screen, on mobile. You were talking how many people experience on mobile. Mm -hmm. So the, the sort of uh, democracy of being able to have almost everybody uh, to do it. So um, we're going to do questions in a second, but I wanted to just show a couple of pieces. Dan has something really cool. Oh, yeah. I've got yeah to bring you, of course, you, this you is the first. thing that the New York Times sent out, which sort of changed so many people's life. And you can even put, for instance, branding on it, you know, so that we have that. And now Dan has something super cool, too. Oh, you're talking um, about this thing? Yeah. And so. Well, yeah, so to the props, and we can show some videos later. So uh, I think probably everyone's heard of Google Cardboard by this point. Uh, this, I, I like to call it uh, like spectacles, <laughs> all right? Actually, that's like Snapchat took that, but um, these things, you can carry them around. It's called a homey dough, and you just um, open them up. So I had them in my pocket, and then uh, he was mentioning uh, you know, YouTube here. I'm looking at my thing in YouTube. It goes stereoscopic, and then you just put this right on, and then you're in it. It's pretty amazing, right? So I think there's a lot of you know, fun little things like that that, uh, that, can, that fit really well into people's lives. Um, so the, the most basic have, way, too, and, and we'll just show you a couple of things, is the Theta here, which is really tiny. It's a couple hundred dollars. It was the first one of the market. The stills are great. Video maybe not so good, I think, but uh, simple to put in your pocket, and uh, I think you can live stream with this, too. Uh, this is what you guys use, right? The Samsung. Yeah. Samsung Gear 360. Yeah. Yeah, and you gave them to pretty much all your journalists around the world. Yeah, you guys, t t talk a bit about that, how, how, uh, how you thought to sort of deal with that. For, first of all, it's pretty small, isn't it? Yeah, so, um, you know, basically, uh, this is just to make sure that you don't put it down and scratch your lens, but you can put this on any tripod. And then uh, you can even put it on a drone, by the way, which we've done and gotten aerial shots from this. Uh, and then uh, once you, you know, you then have it at the right height, you don't even need to use a remote. You can just push and record. You can literally put this on your head. And we're shooting a 360 video right now. And now Jeff Jarvis is doing a, a, <laughs> a, a, a 360 selfie. Uh, but, you know, I, what I like about this is uh, it's $350. You can get it at Best Buy, all right, probably even Target now. And uh, you don't need to have a Samsung phone to, uh, phone to use it. You can just pop the SD card out and then uh, edit away. There's some other software. We have links up in the, um, uh, the, the, the site about it. But uh, there's this, I think, uh, misunderstanding out there that, oh, if you want to get into VR, it's going to cost you, you know, many thousands of dollars just to get a camera. And there, you can get that. But now we've got, you know, in the last six months, cameras like this that are kind of pro-consumer grade. And I think it's incredibly smart that the Times is equipping all of its journalists with that. I think we're going to see a lot more of that happening. And I mean, that's when I get excited, not when things are really expensive, but when they get really cheap. So what's interesting to me is, since it's so inexpensive, what have you found makes somebody a really good VR journalist? It's sort of, it, it's interesting. It's sort of unpredictable. Um, um, I mean, I would say, right, Cassie Bracken, who's in the audience, has been one of our best shooters. And it's in part because she has a deep uh, experience as a video journalist. But she started as a rock star video journalist, too, right? <laughs> right, so. right, right. And, um, and I think, you know, part of it is that, like, you're able to, um, to get out of the way, you know, and that you're not afraid to be able to like uh, find the moment and turn the camera on at the right moment. Um, I mean, I would say, so uh, you know, our, 
people who have experience in video journalism, that's been kind of a natural um, extension. And also because we really rely on interviews and voiceover, and um, that it's not just somebody who's necessarily trained as a photographer who, who's used to just grabbing the image but not dealing with the information. Like, we really need somebody who can be reporting in a number of different ways. So it's better to come from a video background than it is to come from I, a, a... I mean, but, but then also, th that's definitely not exclusive. I mean, part of what's fun about our team is that we all have like very different backgrounds and that we're bringing different ideas to the table. I mean, like we were saying like, you know, I part of the reason I was drawn to this was because I did immersive theater. So I was used to looking at a room in every direction and figuring out what choice I needed to make to tell the story, even if somebody was looking here and maybe we wanted them to look here. Um, so I think uh, it's the type of medium to be sort of unafraid of. Um, and, uh, it, you know, because the cameras are, are so small and accessible, it, you really can learn pretty quickly. Yeah, and, and just one, one quick thing on, on that too. Um, you've given them to photographers, you've given them to reporters, you've given them to video people. Mm -hmm. And um, so the bar is, is sort of small, inexpensive, and YouTube is free. And so nearly anyone can do this, and some people just do have a real knack for it. Yeah. Well, I had one student that was very interesting. He said, um, uh, when he came back from having made a bunch of shots, he says, think about putting the camera between two worlds. So when you look in one way, and, and you could see sort of out the front door of the cafe, but then uh, you can see the street outside, but then all of a sudden you turn around and inside there's a giraffe in the cafe or something. And so rather than just uh, people is instinctively like, let's put it in the middle of the room there because we can see everything. But here, where would you put a VR camera right here if you, we, right here, okay. And that's something that, in, in, at the beginning I would have stuck in the middle of the room and, and now that's very cool because and, now and you're- For the headsets you have to think about where someone's head gonna be. Right. And the height of it's, it, it's, too. It's key. And then you have to think, OK, who's my target audience if it's kids? You need to put that camera at a kid's level. Otherwise, right. they're going to feel like a giant, and vice versa. I, I call it the Smurf effect. You, you, <laughs> you can make anyone feel like a Smurf, and it's very unsettling. Right. You know, well, and right? then, and like then way down here in, and the same, in the same breath, those rules are really fun to break then, yeah. too. Well, Do you, you, can, know? you, you like know? When, when, yes. you're, when you place something over a parade, and then it feels like you're like hovering on top, as long as you understand you do it what the effect is. Yeah. Do you know? And as a journalist, it's quite strange. I was just shooting the uh, last few days in Chicago and to describe to this woman, we want you to walk around the room and talk to people and then sort of show things around. And then you run away and hide in a room. And then you start saying prayers that it's going to work out. Because until she finishes and she knocks on the door and says, like, I'm finished. I was like, no, that was too short. Go again. There was a and lot then, of hiding uh, involved. Yeah, and then you don't know until you look at it. I think maybe on the higher ends and maybe some of the things that Nani's doing that you can see. But for, for many people. I think the camera's coming out right now, uh, very inexpensive ones from China that stream automatically to your phone right. so that you can look at what you're shooting from the other which room. Which is really helpful. Which we really need, I guess. Yeah, yeah exactly. totally. Because yeah. that way we just cut down on the number of prayers that I have to do in that way. So, so uh, Professor Jarvis has the microphone. We thought maybe we could Plus see if, uh, if, if anybody had questions. Um, I, I have to say that I've been doing this for about a year, and these two people on stage are people that I could probably pepper to death with questions for eight hours. So um, there's uh, someone over there. Just say your name and. <clears throat> okay. Um, hi, I'm DC Livers. I'm the managing editor for the Historical Black Press Foundation. So we represent about 450 African American newspapers in the U.S., Western Africa, Black Europe, and Brazil. Um, and we always feel left out of these conversations. Um, we have a unique audience that, um, you know, we are we're feeling Black Lives Matter fatigue too. But there's still stories there. That, that need to be told. And so we have an issue with funding. We have an issue of learning about these things before they're already you know, hot in the mainstream media. And I, I feel like I'm having deja vu um, from the digital divide, because I was working in mainstream media when I realized, oh my god, it's a train wreck for black media. They're not going to be online. But it was a train wreck for everybody, well, every media, well, too. Well, our audience particularly um, was having trouble keeping their home phones on, which back then it was dial-up, right, to even have the access. But now they over-index on social media, using the cell phone. So technology is finally caught up, and they'll be able to take advantage of this, this technology. Is there a way to, for us to get some help so that we can start? We already had launched our Black Press 360 program, but we, we're having a funding issue to be able to actually create this content that I think a lot of people want to see. So is there, is there a way that we can you know, be involved in this to make sure that um, all communities can be represented? 
I mean, I think part of part of what I've been seeing, and even like watching how Jenna at the magazine was starting sort of to build this VR community and to become a part of a VR community. I remember last year watching her reply to an email, and like after Fight for Fallujah came out, and and there was a whole bunch of people who were like, "How did you do that?" And she was like, "This is how we did it." Do you know? And it, it's not the type of thing where I think people are like guarding the secrets of like how the story was told. It's actually like an incredibly um, include like in terms of like being like the, like exchange of information and this is how we made it work. Like, at least from what I've experienced so far, people are very um, generous in that. In terms of funding, that, that I don't know, but like. I, I would encourage you very strongly to, to talk I was gonna to say, yeah. Journalism 360. <laughs> yeah. Right, so that, that organization exists so that it can share all this knowledge. That's one. Two is, what would you say is the cheapest possible way to get going? I think this little camera is the cheapest way to get going. Which costs, well, either one. 150 yeah. or this one here. I would go with this one, the Gear 360. And, and if then, anyone would like to see any of these afterwards. We yeah, we have them here. The, the one disadvantage is that it works predominantly with a Samsung phone and a PC. But in that way, um, I, think the, the, I don't think the bar has ever been lower. Uh, YouTube is free. This camera costs 350 bucks. We've already made a million mistakes, so you guys should just start making mistakes. There's like no one person, well there's some, well one of them's here, but be, after that it like falls off quickly to like person who knows everything. So I think you're right, there's a huge community online of people, like someone said like, oh I just saw this great YouTube tutorial. And literally that's the kind of information we're trading back and forth, it was like, did you see so and so did this tutorial where he has this? It was like, oh cool. And that's how we learn. I don't know about you guys, but. I mean, well, the, the sorry. <laughs> The question was really about funding. So funding for what? For people, for in time, for equipment, for? I guess training, equipment. Okay. Um, we could probably pick um, major cities, like maybe 10 major cities, or maybe we do a lot with Nigeria, as well as Facebook is, uh -huh. is doing a lot with them, too. Um, we could maybe pick people to head up that particular division, and that's our African content, or that would be our you know, sort of thing, but equipment, if we, even if we just had 10, that's 350 times 10. Yeah, I mean, right? So you know, it starts my, to add up for very small mom and pop, um, African American owned publications. It's, ex, it's extremely. So I've run, a, I've run a startup before, I've been funded before, I've, I've gotten Knight Foundation funding before. What I can tell you in my experience is that it's always easier, and this goes for anybody, but I think in particular, I, I understand, I mean, I'm, I'm Hispanic myself, so. I, I have run into that same uh, uh, wall you're talking about, but if you do some really cool shit with very little, and then you just put it out there, which this does not cost much, okay? Um, you, and then you lead with that, I think that that's gonna, and this goes for everybody, right? Uh, funders want to accelerate creative people, right? What, what they're already doing. Um, and it's not a, I mean, I think two years ago, yeah, you would have probably needed to get a few thousand dollars in, in, from somebody to do this. I mean, I, I was able to invest in this through my endowed share because I have an endowed share, but I don't have a ton of money to spend. So I was even cheap within that. And I just started buying, you know, uh, you know cameras and equipment here and there. I called it the digital petting zoo collection. And then I just turned it over to students to see what they could do with it. And I think, you know, if, if you, you want to you want to operate like the Rebel Alliance, not like the Empire, right? Like scrappy in you know ice caves with wires. Like, I think journalism 360. Kind of the concept is to begin making lessons. Uh, I know um, there was Marcel did an interview of people who are practicing it and with their ideas, and I think that's part of the thing that you're going to generate is, and we're going to the same place that you are too. The great thing about these small cameras is you can edit on your phone. So you don't even really need a laptop. Everyone's already got a phone that's pretty much willing to do it. And you can watch on your phone too. So I agree with Dan, the bar is, is pretty low. And the, the idea of just jumping in to try it, because I'm pretty sure that uh, there's some people in your organization that will just take to it like this. And pretty soon we're going to be going like, whoa, check this out. And then we'll be sending you an email, like, how did you guys do that? You know. So that's sort of where we are now, just wild west. Uh, hey, Ben Schwartz, uh, freelance VR 360 creator. Um, Maureen, two questions. Um, number one, does the department uh, have plans to start creating content with cameras other than the Samsung gear? Um, that was the first question. And the second question was you, you alluded to um, people pitching your department projects. Just wonder if you could talk a little bit about that process. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, I mean, I think the Times in general um, uses a wide variety of cameras um, because a lot of what 
Daily 360 does is breaking news. The majority of what we're using is the Samsung cameras and the Google Jump and the Omni are used for more long form. Um, so I would say over the range of the organization, there's also a range of cameras, but because of the speed of what we do, um, there, the Samsung is really our, our best ally. Um, and but the magazine, I think, uh, the, is the using many kinds of many cameras kinds. too. Yeah, yeah, totally. And that's that bar is always going to move, right? Yeah, don't, yeah. Don't, and don't that's going to be technology agnostic, right? It's and gonna, company agnostic. Yeah, yeah, it's going to it changes so fast. Um, and and yeah, we we take pitches all the time. Um, so like that's, I mean, I would say like you know we're really open. Like if especially if you have already been making VR, if you know how to stitch, if you know how to edit, if you know how to storytell in this medium, like we're we're open to that. You know, and it's been actually really interesting. I think in the first couple months as we launched, that it's kind of like, who who's who's good. You know, like um, I mean, we don't uh, of the shooters. We have a lot of people shooting. Not a lot of those shooters can stitch yet, you know. Like if you if you have that type of understanding of the material, then like, you know, we're happy to hear from you. <laughs> like and stitching is just just to explain is that the camera captures two images and then they have to be literally stitched together. But just imagine a moving quilt. So yeah. it's a bit complicated in technology, but things like uh, yours uh, and, and this camera stitch automatically in the camera. This is the lowest level. So the technology that you need to know for one of these is, well, how to turn it on and, and then where to put it. And just, I mean, the, the stitching may not make a whole lot of sense, but this has two cameras on it. So it's much easier for the software to just go stick them together. When you have the, like the GoPro Omni, that's six GoPros, and then the Google Jump is how many, like 20 or yeah, something? Yeah, so this is the more complicated yeah. version of what Dan is holding up there. Too. So that, that's like the GoPro, that's the, the GoPro rig, and the GoPro Omni is sort of a pro version. But with this, while you get higher resolution, the challenge is then the software is approximating this, it's basically turning all these uh, two-dimensional images into a sphere, and it, sometimes it doesn't quite work. Right, right, so, the, so it, the complication rises that way. We have yeah. time for one more. Okay. Oh, hi, my name is Sharad. I'm from Verizon. I have one quick question. In your experience, what kind of content works well with 360 medium and what doesn't work? Well, Maureen, you, you take this one because you guys have done a lot. <laughs> Um, I mean, I think... You talked a bit about travel, which is one thing. Yeah. And you talked a bit about news. Yeah, we have a great partnership with travel. Um, we, have, uh, we have great partnerships. Um, I mean, we work with every desk in the building. So I think our assumption is that we can find a VR piece in, in a wide variety of content. So our hope is not to be like, this is what we do. Our hope to be a, is to be like, tell us your story and let's see if we can find what the 360 piece of that is. Um, and whether that's something like we saw with the travel piece, the 52 places where it's embedding a single piece, or whether we're editing together a more complicated narrative, um, I think our goal is to be able to like embrace the stories that are coming in across the building, and then to be able to peel out like what piece of that story is best told in 360. Would you say part of it is just thinking of, is it a visual story? Is that the first level for you? Yeah, totally, totally. I mean, I think that's sort of huge. Like, where is it taking place? Why do I want to be there? Um, why is this something that I need to see instead of read about? And why is it something that I need to see in every direction? Um, you know, that's, uh, I mean, we just have to keep asking that over and over again. So it could be in any subject, maybe except analysis. Although, <laughs> I'd, I'd be willing to bet you there's probably a cool analysis well, one to do too, so. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, with like, you know, with graphics and stuff, I think part of what we're trying to, to do is though to find like where, part of the boon of making something every day is that we're like, we're continually tilling the soil for what works. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so just, uh, we'll put the links to these things we talked about in uh, this Google Doc. Again, it's bit.ly up to, the numeral two, speed VR. Um, and uh, tweeting that out to a hashtag or something? We sh there is a hashtag here. Hashtag Night Awards. So we'll, we'll tweet it to the hashtag yeah, as well. Tweet to the hashtag as well. So uh, Bob, Maureen, Dan, thank you very, very much.